G'day internet, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. It's week three of Surprised by Jesus. Buckle up for an amazing message. If you're at home and you're really enjoying our content, how about liking our channels, subscribing to our channels, or maybe sharing them with a family or a friend that you reckon may be interested. Austin Stone Worship is today's awesome worship partner, guys. The words will be on the screen, so if you're at home, maybe join in.
who's able to forgive only Jesus who is our righteousness only Jesus who opens up our eyes only Jesus So here it is guys, week three of Surprised by Jesus. If you missed the first two weeks, go back and listen on your favorite podcast apps. Until then, here it is, our very good friend, Steve Hall. Well, g'day Elevate Online family. It's so good to be back. Haven't been around for a while, but it's good to be back with you and to share with you today. I wonder, the question I've got for you today though is, have you had any surprises lately? Has something happened that's just gone, wow? And if so, how are you doing with that? 
how are you going with your surprise? My wife, a few years ago, actually a number of years ago now, it was her birthday, and I decided to do the best thing I could think of, which was to have a surprise party. So we went all the way. I got the house full of people. It must have been about 60, 70 people jammed into our little house. We had parked all over the street so Margie couldn't see where the cars were parked or that anyone was visiting us. We had the place filled with balloons. We had food. We went all the way. We're waiting there quiet. The lights turned off. The blinds are pulled. And Margie turned up in the driveway. We're all ready to go with the poppers and the bangers. She opened the door. And all of a sudden, everyone said, surprise! Of which Marg looked with total disgust, turned her right around and walked off. And I went, what do I do now? I got this party and the actual VIP has just walked off. So I followed Margie down the street. I said, Marg, what's happening? We've got a party for you. She said, well, I don't want a party. If, if you want a party, you have a party. Don't do that for me. I think it may have been something to do with the way she was dressed and the idea that she hadn't done her hair. I don't know. But it took me a while to convince her that it would be a good thing to come back and to join in the party. Margie did not like that surprise. About 10 years later, I was sitting in my house and uh, watching the footy. Saturday evening, watching the footy. I've got my, my back and we had a lounge and the, the front door was to the back and I'm watching this footy engrossed with the game. So all of a sudden I hear this noise of people coming in my front door. A bag went over my head. I was pushed to the floor um, and tied up with my hands behind my back. The people who had rushed in were wearing better clavers and, and it was like, what is going on? Now, I'm not sure if you remember, but I struggle with claustrophobia. Having a bag on your head and tied up, not a good thing. They took me outside. They dragged me outside. They put me into a vehicle. No, it was not a van. No, it was not a large station wagon. No, it was not a four-door vehicle. It was a small two-door sports car. They pushed me in the back. Did I tell you that I suffer from claustrophobia? They shut, put the, the chair against me and I'm now laying in the back of this vehicle. We're driving towards somewhere that took, it's probably only about a five minute drive away, but they drove for 20 minutes and with music blaring, deciding to grow, go, drive with great speed around corners, me being thrown in the back. Reminder. I suffer from claustrophobia. We are driving the white round and finally we get to this destination. They open the car door. They drag me out. I'm thinking I'm just about to be tortured or something. They took me into this large room that I listened and it was just quiet. And they dragged me to facing what I thought was a wall, but it ended up being a door. They untied my hands. They ripped the... the the bag off my head, and there I am, white as a sheet, scared stiff, wondering what's going to happen next. And there was 200 people in this large room saying, surprise, it was my birthday party. Let me tell you, that was not a pleasant surprise. But I want to suggest to you that surprises actually have a different response to different people. Some people love surprises. There's a good surprise. You know, that gift, the friend that turns up unexpected, the pay rise. Now, that could be a good surprise for all of us. But then there's the bad surprise. You know, the death of a close friend. Just this week, I went to a, a funeral of a friend of mine who was much younger than me, who found out four weeks ago he had cancer. He was doing well. He found cancer. He was now at his funeral. That was a shock. That was a surprise. Or maybe it's the surprise of going to work and discovering that you're asked not to come back on Monday. That unexpected surprise can sometimes be a bad surprise. And there's two types of people, well, there's probably many types of people, but there's some that hate surprises. 
you know that control freak that just wants to make sure that they've got everything under control, everything set up? Don't surprise me. In fact, I had a board chair once who started, I came and he said, Steve, I have one rule and one rule only. It's simple, no surprises. Well, then you've got those who are the carefree, happy people that don't, and they love surprises. Give me another surprise. Let's do a surprise. They love the surprise. They don't like the, the normalities. They don't like just to, everything to be the same. Surprise me. Let's have something different. Let's try a different restaurant. Let's, let's be surprised. There's a lady by the name of Tanya Luna. She actually is a psychologist. Um, she's also a quite regular on TED Talks. And she was also the co-founder of the surprise industry. It's the world's only company that specializes in surprises. And she conducts research and her concept is that we all need to have surprises in life to push us to different places, to different discoveries, to try something different. In fact, she would say that there are four phases of surprise. There's the freeze, which can be 1 25th of a second. And then there's the um, analysis. What is that? What's going on? And after that comes the wonder. And after the wonder, the last phase is the action. And I want to suggest to you that sometimes we need a good surprise to break us out of the boredom of predictability. That when we know how everything works, we get stuck in a box and we get bored with that. And that can be sometimes quite true in, in our belief system and in our worldview and what we think about individuals or what we think about the world or maybe what we even think about religion, Christianity, our belief system. And we can get so caught up in the boredom of it because it's all locked in, it's all placed that sometimes we need to be shocked to actually see something different. And I think that's what actually happened one day when in the in the Gospels, which we call the Bible, and there's a Gospels and stories of Jesus. And Jesus was doing this amazing sermon. In fact, if there's any part of scripture that you need to, or the Bible that you, I'd encourage you to know, most important, I think, which is, you might say, well, it's the death and burial of Jesus, but that's important. But his teachings found in Matthew, which was written by one of his disciples called Matthew 5, 6, and 7, to me are the foundations of what Jesus is teaching us. It's called his Sermon on the Mount. It's his manifesto. It's his yoke of teaching that every rabbi would have. And he's, he's on this mountain. Everyone's crowding around. He always seems to gather a crowd. He's crowding around and he starts to give this teaching. And at the end of it, Matthew writes this. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, the crowds were amazed, or if you like, they were shocked. In the Passion Translation, it describes it as they were dazed and overwhelmed. This teaching was different. This teaching was different to what they've heard. This teaching was different to any rabbi. This was, wow, I haven't heard a rabbi say that before. You see, the rabbis and the teachings of the day was all about the rewards of getting it right with God that if you are sick, well, you're not right with God. If you're poor, you're not right with God. If the teaching was all about the rewards of actually living a perfect life and making sure that your life was right by going through all the sacrifices and all that. If you got that right, and all the teachings and the explanations of the, what they called the Torah, which was the original um, first books of the Bible, the, the law books, if you actually lived that right, then everything would be right. And if it's not right with you, you haven't got those rewards of a healthy life, then you, there's something wrong. You see, their reward was in the revelation. Their reward was in being relieved from the problems of this world. Their reward was, was making sure that you were religiously in the right place. But Jesus' teaching was different. 
You see, his reward was in a relationship. And that would have been what amazed these guys who were listening to the teachings of Jesus because he spoke with an authority that was built out of a desire of relationship. He, he also spoke about this in another sermon. This one wasn't the Sermon on the Mount. This was called the Sermon on the Plain. You find this in Luke 6. It was probably spoken before the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus had been um, had just gathered his disciples. He'd been up on the mountain praying. He'd come down. He, he identified who his disciples were. He walks out onto a plain and people gathered around. He, he looks at his disciples and he starts to share with them a whole bunch of teaching. And at the end of this teaching, he gives what we call a parable, a story to explain the importance of his teaching. And I want to share this story with you. You find it in the, the gospel or the book of Luke. Um, that's in the second half of the Bible in chapter 6, verse 46. And it's a great story. And you've probably heard it before if you've been around the church or even if you haven't, probably in Sunday school, you would have heard this story. And it goes like this, verse 46. So why do you call me Lord, Lord? Jesus says to them. Now, Lord, Lord, in those days would have been similar to God. Um, why do you call me this Jehovah Jireh, this God? This, why do you call me that? And yet you don't do what I say. Well, that's a scary thing, isn't it? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me and listens to my teachings, which he's just given them, and then follows it. It's like a person that builds this house who digs deep and lays a foundation on solid rock. Now, I live in the hills. We have rocks in the hills. We're not on the flats in Perth where there's lots of sand. We're on rock. There's some good things about building on a rock and there's some bad things if you want to dig a hole for a tree. But if you build your house on the rock, he said, when the flood waters rise up and break against the house, when that storm comes and the winds come, it stands firm. It stands strong. Why? Because it's well built on a strong foundation. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey, that's like a person who builds a house right on the sandy ground without a foundation. And when the floods come, and sweep down against that house, it collapses and it falls into a heap of ruins. See, there's two, two stories here and you might go, yeah, that makes sense. But let's dig a little bit deeper and maybe be a little bit surprised about what Jesus is teaching here. But not only what he's teaching, the rewards that's found in Jesus' teaching. See, the first thing that you find in this, there's two people, but they both have storms. Here's what happens. Storms happen. You see, the, the storms will happen in life. Surprise, storms are going to happen. There's no promise that when the storm comes, magically the storm disappears, is taken away. No, no. The storm, Jesus says, will come. See, the problem isn't the storm. You will get storms in life. They will happen. And the rains will come. And the winds of life will smash against us. And some of us, you're probably even going through a storm right now. Maybe things aren't looking great. Maybe you've heard some bad news. Maybe you are facing some struggles with finances. Maybe you are finding struggles within relationship, within marriage. Storms will come. Jesus never promised that they would go away. Yet the rabbis sort of suggested that if you've got storms, you've got a problem. Jesus is saying that they're going to happen. Everyone in life will face the storms. Surprise? Here's the first surprise. Storms are going to happen. In fact, can I tell you something? Jesus 
loves a good storm. He, 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 the storms in the Bible all the time. He actually, like, he, he says, he walks on storms. There's a storm happening and it wasn't flat water when Jesus walked on water. That was a storm happening. And he's going, bring it on. I'm going to walk on top of the storm. He slept in a storm. When he died on a cross, there was a storm. It says there was, the place shook, the earth shook. See, storms do happen. Jesus never promised that storms wouldn't happen. And you might face a storm in your life. Let me tell you, it happened. And sometimes, you know how when it rains, we run outside with the umbrella to try and stop the rain from coming? Or we're trying to find that cover? Well, the truth is, you can't run from the storms of life because they will come. And it's not the storm that's the problem. In fact, Jesus promised this. He says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow's got enough worries for itself. In other words, don't worry about the storms. Of day. There's, there's more storms coming tomorrow. Let's just work on the storm for today. In fact, he also said that in this world, you will have troubles. In, in some versions, it says you will have troubles of many kinds or many troubles. But take heart. You see, the storm will come. And I want to surprise you today with the teachings of Jesus that says that storm will happen. But it's not the storm that's the focus. You see, the storm, it it's reveals your foundation. The storm actually reveals your foundation. When that storm comes, it identifies if your house is crumbling, it's probably because your foundation isn't great. Storms will come because they reveal what it is that we've been built on. They expose our foundations. You know, when you're facing hardship in our society, we want to run from it. We want to try and get, we want to feel good, right? And maybe when that storm comes, we just even want to walk away from it. Or maybe we might try and pop a pill or have a drink or do something just to try and get the storm away. I don't want to face this storm. Oh, that storm that you're going through, that storm is actually revealing something of significance. It's revealing your foundation. What are you built on? What is your strength? For some of us, you know, that, that, that storm that we have, we feel like it's going to break us and pull us apart. And if it does, it's probably because God's just wanting to show us that the foundations of life that we've hung on to probably aren't, aren't great. But I want to tell you something. You see, the guy that built his house on the rock, when the storm came, his house, his life, the life that we've got, still held together. It doesn't say that some things didn't blow off, but the house stood together. But if you go to the next person, next guy, who built his house on the sand, interesting you'll notice that it says this, but anyone who hears, this is what Jesus said, the guy that built his house on the hand, he said, but anyone who hears and disobeys is like a person who hearing the word but still not caring for the poor. See, he says, the, the guy who built his house on the sand, it was like a guy that, that heard my words but didn't obey it and didn't put it into practice. Like hearing God's teaching, going to church every Sunday, reading the Bible, knowing all the things about the Bible, but we don't care about the poor. That's like hearing Jesus' word and not building a foundation. Or we hear his word and, and, and we and about, about forgiveness, and yet I can't forgive a brother or a sister or someone that's done me wrong hearing the word, but still having bitterness in my heart. Hearing the word, but still being racist, still denying others because of their race or even their belief system. You see, the foundations of Jesus' teachings that you find, they become 
the foundation that makes us strong. But the person that hears the word and still doesn't put it into practice, it's like building a house on the sand. And when tough times come, you might believe in Jesus. You might have sat under his teachings. You might come to church every week. But if we don't actually allow that word to become the foundation of who we are, of what we do, about how we live, then the house falls down. See, here's the surprise. Jesus wants you to build your house on his teaching because the reward is that your house will stand. I love this because it says, it's, it's interesting because in Jesus' teaching, it was so reversed to everybody else's. If you have a look at it, if you go back a few verses to, to um, uh, chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus is saying some crazy stuff. He says this, he says, blessed if you're poor. Hang on a minute. Blessed if you're poor? In that culture, if you were poor, you weren't blessed. You were downcast. But Jesus is reversing it. He's going, actually, you're blessed if you're poor. You're blessed if you're grieving, if you're, if you're struggling with that inner pain. You're blessed. What? That doesn't make sense, Jesus. You're blessed if you have been humbled. If someone's humbled you, if you are humbled and you're, you're blessed. But no, no, you're supposed to promote yourself. You're supposed to walk around as though you're, you've got it all together. No, 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 no. You're blessed. God will bless you if you're humble. You're blessed if you're hungry. Oh, why? That doesn't sound right. You're blessed if you are merciful and kind to other people. You're blessed if your heart is right and pure. You're blessed if you work for peace and that peace is more important to you than being right. You're blessed if you're being persecuted and put down. You're blessed if people mock you. So that, that's the surprise of his teaching. He's going, the reward actually isn't about being right. The reward is about the foundation, that God is the one that blesses you. And then he goes on to the next part of his teaching in verse 24, where he identifies the opposite, which is this. It says, but sorrows await those who are rich. Oh, no. Why? Because if I put my trust in my riches and it, I lose them, I'm going to be very sorrowful. Life's not going to be great. Sorrow awaits those who are complete and content in themselves. Oh, I feel good. I've got everything together. When life falls apart, when the storms come, guess what happens? Sorrow awaits you. Sorrow awaits those, who, who, those of you who laugh now who've got the joys of life, that life just seems great and I feel comfortable in life. Well, let me tell you, if that's your foundation, sorrows are waiting because when they fall apart, sorrow comes. Sorrows await those who, who are always honoured and lifted up and if I'm all about my stature and about what people think of me, or when I do the wrong thing and they let me go, if that's what I've built my life on, sorrow happens. Can you see what Jesus is saying? He's, he's changing it all around. He's going, you know what the thing that the world puts into place, that we, we, if we can get our life together, life's happy. If I've got a good bank account, life's happy. Well, if that's your strength, if that's your foundation of life, look out. Because when the storm comes and those things happen, you're left with nothing. But guess what? Blessed are those that make their foundation in God. Because when you're poor, I've still got God. When I'm struggling, I've still got God. When I've been accused and persecuted, I've still got God. Because you can't take that foundation away. The reward isn't in what I have in this world. The reward is in my relationship with God because you cannot take that away. Thank you so, so much for joining us today on the Elevate Online Experience, guys. 
If you'd like to help us reach and build into people just like you all over the world, the ways to give can be found just below. Until then, have a great week.